Here we go. So, have you ever wondered what the purpose of your senses is? What's the purpose of vision, audition, touch, taste, and smell? If you boil it down to the essence, you have senses for one purpose and one purpose only, which is to provide your brain with a window to the outside world. It's the only information you're receiving from this outside world, and quite frankly, it's actually limited. You see a certain spectrum of light, you can feel a certain spectrum of touch, you can hear a certain spectrum of sound, and that's all the information that you're getting. So what does your brain do with that information? Well, it's trying to make sense of the senses. And think about it. Initially, you don't know what it is that you're seeing. You don't know what it is that you're feeling. You don't know what it is that you're touching. But over time, with experience, you start developing a model of what you think is the world out there. And we explain this model by saying we're creating assumptions. We create assumptions about, for instance, a big object is going to be heavy. And we have all sorts of other assumptions, and they will be incorporated into our perception. And I want to give you one example where you can see this quite clearly with all of you. So what you should be seeing here is a set of balls, and most of them are tilted inwards, so they're concave. But there's one that is tilted outwards, which is convex, right? So that's the one at the center. Now I'm going to turn this image by 180 degrees. And something really awkward happened, didn't it? The one in the center that used to be convex is suddenly concave, and all the other ones that used to be concave are suddenly convex, right? I didn't change anything about the sensory information that you're receiving, but what just changed is your perception. And your perception has changed because you have assumptions about the world. And the assumptions that you have in this case is that light is coming from above. And that's usually the case, right? The sun's coming from above, the lights in the rooms are usually coming from above. And if light is coming from above, then if an object is convex and light is coming from above, the shadow should be in the bottom. And if an object is concave and light is coming from above, the shadow should be on the top. And this is why we are interpreting this two-dimensional image, in fact, as a three-dimensional thing, because we have experiences and we have assumptions about what the world is like. So this tells us something about perception, which is quite fundamental. The idea is that perception is never a reflection of your pure sense of information, but it's always a combination of also your expectations, your assumptions, the beliefs that you have, the context that you're in. And so perception is nothing else but a reinterpretation of sensory information according to your beliefs. And that is quite interesting. It's interesting for two reasons. The first one, it explains why my world is different from your world or different from your neighbor's world. Even though if we had the same eyes, the same ears, if we had the exact same sensory system, I would perceive the world differently than you would because I have made different experiences. I make different assumptions about the world. But in addition to that, it also has an impact on our health. And that's what I want to talk about today. And therefore, we have to kind of back up a little bit. So far, I've talked about the senses that we usually know about, vision, audition, touch, taste, and smell. But actually, there's something missing in this picture. All of these senses, they provide us with information about the outside world. But we also have a window to the inside world, namely our bodies, and that's what we're constantly interacting with. And what most of us don't know is that we have this vast amount of senses in the body that detect everything from how fast your heart is beating right now, to the salts concentration in your blood. And now all of these different sensors, they project along the same information pathway up into an area very deep in the brain, if you are a primate, which is called the insular cortex. And the insular cortex contains this tiny high-resolution map of the current state of your body right now. So while you're sitting in this audience and you're listening to me, what's actually going on, if it would change, let's see. Here we go. No, that's back. That's also going on inside you, but it's not what I wanted to show you. Um, can you go back a slide? OK, and now front. One more. Maybe the battery's dying. So 
So anyway, once they figure that out, I can explain it to you anyway. So the idea is while you're sitting in this audience, what happens is that your brain and your body are constantly interacting. So you're receiving sensory information from the body, and then you also have beliefs about what the state of your body should be in right now. And so basically what happens is your brain and your body are constantly chit-chatting, and you don't realize this most of the time. But now imagine, let's move this fast forward, um, now imagine that suddenly your, your heart would start racing. And in the case when your heart starts racing, you'd be thinking, oh gosh, something is wrong. Maybe I'm getting a heart attack. Or maybe I was drinking too much coffee this morning, right? But actually, if you were going for a run now, you're in a different context, and if your heart would start racing there, you wouldn't think that's weird. So our idea is that our beliefs are also influencing how we are regulating our body, how we're responding to specific sense of information because we are reinterpreting it. And now at some point we have to go back to some slide. <laughs> um. Okay, let's start with this, whatever. So the idea is that how can you study whether how brain and body are interested in each other and how that is influenced by our beliefs. And so the way we can do this is by saying, okay, we test how we're reacting to signals from the body. And here's one single thing. This morning when you got up and you were hungry, what happened is that your stomach was producing a little hormone, which is called ghrelin, and that's called the hunger hormone because it's projecting hunger to the brain. Now, people were wondering, can I influence hormone production in the body by changing your assumptions? And the way they did it is by presenting people, they came to the laboratory, they were all hungry, and you had two milkshakes. And one was labeled rich, and the other one was labeled light. But unbeknownst to the participants, those milkshakes were exactly identical. The only difference is the label. So do you think there would be any difference in your physical reaction depending on which milkshake you drink? Turns out the answer is yes. If you were drinking the one that's labeled rich, you're producing less of the hunger hormone ghrelin in your stomach. Now think about this for a second. It basically means that a mere thought or assumption that some, what substance does to us is actually changing hormone production, not in your brain, but actually in your stomach. And it's an effect that we've all heard about. It's called the placebo effect. Except that usually we don't tend to think about the placebo effect in that way. We tend to think the placebo effect, oh yeah, that's when I, I think I'm going to feel better and then I end up feeling better, right? But what you can see is that the placebo effect has physical consequences on your body. You can trigger an immune response, you can change hormone production, that's something you can measure. It's not just all in your head. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. There's something called the nocebo effect. You know that one? So the nocebo effect means that something I think that might be harmful to me can actually harm me. And so there's one case where a student took part in a scientific study and they were testing painkillers. So he would receive painkillers every day of the period of one month. But what he did is instead of taking them, he collected them and took them all at once because he wanted to commit suicide. <laughs> um, so he ends up in the clinic, and he's actually about to die. And then the, the um, doctors, they call up the scientists, and they say, what on earth did you put in those pills? And the scientists were saying nothing. He was receiving the placebo. And so only after the doctors told him, he was slowly recovering from his symptoms. Okay, so what this should tell us is that we have an effect on our body. We're, the way we're regulating our body is partially depending on the sensory information that we're receiving and partially depending on our beliefs. And so here's something that's interesting for us, right? Because that has an implication on health. But in order to use this, we need to understand it. We need to understand what's actually going on. And this is where the tricky part starts. So how can we study that? Well, we need two things, at least. First one is, we know this is a circular problem. It's a circular problem because belief influence how we're regulating the body, the body feeds back into the brain, and we're constantly chit-chatting with each other, and we don't know, is this information coming from the body, is it coming from the brain? So we need to monitor each part of the system. That's the first thing we need to do. And one of the tricks that we do is we're trying to monitor a part of the system that's quite easy to monitor, which is your heart. And we use ECG for that. But then you have to see, okay, so how is the brain perceiving the heart? 
How is the brain actually regulating each single heartbeat? So what we also do is we measure brain activity, and we do that um, via EEG. But finally, what we also need to do is we have to manipulate your beliefs. And the way we're manipulating your beliefs is a bit of a trick. What we do is we play tones that are locked to your own heartbeat. So we give you information about your heart that you could use. But then we trick you a little bit because we start accelerating the tones. And then we see how much you're relying on the tones versus your actual heartbeats. And what you see is that people start speeding up their own heartbeat. They start accelerating. Here's an example of what that sounds like. Could anybody feel something? If we look pregnant, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, OK, so this is the first ingredient. We have to monitor the entire circuit. I told you we need another ingredient, and this is where it gets a bit abstract, because we need to reverse engineer where the signals are coming from. And the only way to do this is actually mass. You already heard I'm a physicist, so this is where my passion is. So what we do is we use a dynamic systems equation and try to infer what part of the information is coming from where and how we combine bodily information with external information about our beliefs. And that tells us something about how well we are actually at perceiving our own bodies. And I want to give you um, an intuition why that field is so much growing at the last, over the last decade. So this is called computational psychiatry. It means we're using algorithms to understand how the brain is interacting with the body and interacting with its environment and how it's incorporating information. And uh, I want to give you an example I think that's easy to get, which is one that probably all of you have experienced before. It's about stress. So back in the days when there was a stressor, what happened is, for instance, you go hiking and you encounter a bear, right? So your brain is releasing this classical stress response, which is um, you are producing um, cortisol, you're releasing cortisol, your adrenaline levels go up, and you get into the fight and flight mode because you want to run away. The problem with stress today is it's a little bit different from that. Stress today is often chronic. So it's constantly there, whatever you do. And now that type of interpretation of stress is weird, right? We're not constantly running into bears, but maybe because the information is coming from something that we constantly carry with us, which is our bodies, our brain interprets the stress as being part of the body. So maybe I'm sick. And if I'm sick, I should start you know, showing an immune response, classical sickness behaviors, things like fatigue, things like social withdrawal. But then, if you continue to have that response and nothing changes in your environment, what do you learn? Well, whatever I do, I'm not successful. And the consequence of that is apathy or things like burnout and depression. So the question is, this is only one potential pathway into depression out of many, many others. And depression is a spectrum disorder. So we don't know if that's the pathway someone took. When we see them, they have bodily symptoms. They always have somatic symptoms. They have symptoms at the level of the brain. They have symptoms at the level of their beliefs. And we don't know which pathway did someone take. But if we want to treat them, we have to treat them at the right level. So sometimes it's actually good to treat someone at the level of the body if they were actually sick. But maybe it's an imbalance in the neurotransmitter systems, and then we should be using drugs. Or maybe it has to do with the beliefs or the stresses in the external world, and then we should be targeting thing, that with things like, for instance, cognitive behavioral therapy. So by using and back reverse engineering where information is coming from, what we can do is we kind of get at the source of the problem, and that might allow us to predict treatment for the individual and not just for a group. OK, so one last note on stress. And that's probably the one that's interesting for you. We usually think some people cope well with stress and others don't, right? So that's the idea of resilience. And one question that we are getting more and more interested in is now, what makes someone resilient? And what makes someone very sensitive to stress? And it turns out one of the key factors seems to be interoceptive awareness. So what that means is, how well are you perceiving the current signals from your body and how well are you regulating them? 
And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If I detect that something's going wrong very early on and I adapt my behavior, so I remove the stressor, or I remove the context, or I'm fighting the disorder, then I have my own little prevention mechanism early on in place so that things never get worse. And I think that this is a new way of thinking about how you can make up your senses and probably one of the keys to the, for the future of psychiatry. So thank you very much.